Our next speaker is Brother Jose Gamez. Jose was born in San Luis Potosi, Mexico. He obeyed the gospel at the age of 15 and shortly thereafter began to teach youth classes and later began preaching for adults. Jose migrated to the USA in 2003 at the age of 17. I'll interject here. And you know English. I wish I could know Spanish as well as he's learned English in those years he's been here. In 2010, he graduated with an associate degree in mechanical engineering technology from Lone Star College and currently works as a mechanical designer. Jose preaches for the Spanish Church of Christ at Spring. It was originally established in 2012 with a few members of his family in Porter, Texas. Since then, Jose has preached in gospel meetings and lectureships around Texas and Mexico. He has no formal education from a school of preaching of the like, he says, but he's been blessed to have met faithful men in the gospel who have served as his mentors. Jose has two daughters, Alexis, nine, and Evelyn, seven. I want to make a remark or two about the uh, last comment of no formal education. I know what he means, and you do too. Brethren, where did we get the idea that a person couldn't take his own Bible and love of God and the love of the truth and benefit of men like the unit did from Philip and become as good a gospel preacher or Bible teacher as anybody could be? We have been sold a bill of goods over the years that unless one goes through a certain training program, then they're not fit to preach the truth. Well, as long as all of those are as sound as they can be, then that's all well and good. But we shouldn't have it in our minds that a person must do that and is not qualified to preach the gospel as the Bible defines a preacher of the gospel. Uh, knowing Jose since 2012, I've come to appreciate him, getting to know the congregation, the Spanish congregation that is presently meeting here in this building is a wonderful thing and we're grateful for them and their love for the truth. And we have some of our Spanish brethren here today. Now they can understand English probably better than I do. <laughs> Jose asked me, uh, do you want one of these brethren to translate for him? Uh, he doesn't need that. But I will ask them, did he do a good job in case I miss some point? That's only a joke. Jose, we appreciate you. And would you come speak to us on that they all may be one, keeping in mind God's platform for unity set out in Ephesians chapter 4. And we want to approach this whole day with that in mind. Jose, please come speak to us. Well, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Brother Brown for, for the good comments that he's made about me. And I also thank you, the Spring Congregation, the elders, especially for the opportunity um, for me to preach the word this morning. And uh, just like David said, I was 17 when I moved to this country, so I've tried my best to learn the language, and I will definitely do my best in present, uh, presenting God's word this morning. Uh, so I would ask you to please open your Bibles in John chapter 17, verses... Uh, 15 through 21, and since the topic that has been assigned to me this morning is that they all may be one, uh, certainly one of the things that I like to do is always go back to uh, the context of where the words are taken so that we can get a good idea of what was meant, and then of course look at the whole, at the whole Bible, uh, just like we've been preaching this morning for the whole unity of the faith to see how this applied in the time that it was written, and also to see how this applies to us in, in the present time that we're living. Uh, so we see in John chapter 17, beginning at verse 15, it says, and uh, let me just uh, tell you that I'm using the, the New King James Version. It says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your, tr your word is truth. 
As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for this alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. They, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Uh, one of the things that Brother Blake was saying towards the end of his lesson is that many times we uh, don't recognize the power of prayer. And when you think of this specific prayer that the Lord is doing in uh, John 17, uh, you will realize that this is a prayer that is being done for the church before the church is even established. Uh, this is a prayer that is being done for the apostles before they even begin their ministry as apostles, uh, testifying of the Christ and, of course, teaching all the doctrine, all the things that the Christ had given them. Uh, so when we think of this prayer at the time that it is done, it is also uh, just before our Lord is uh, taken by the Romans, before he is crucified, before he is uh, put to death, and, of course, uh, after that he will wait and be resurrected and then go back to heaven. But when we think of the apostles, uh, at this specific time, the Lord is praying for them uh, first and foremost for the reason that every time that they run into trouble, the very first thing they did was run to the, uh, to the Lord. And not having the physical presence of the Lord, uh, he is praying the Father, uh, first of all, to bless the apostles. Now, in that prayer, uh, I want to focus on three uh, main things, and there's only three points that I would like to share with you uh, this morning. First, uh, looking at this prayer for the unity of the church, like I said before, the church is even established. Uh, and the second point that I, uh, that I like to emphasize is, look at the unity that the church showed in the first century, and then the, the third point will have to do with the unity that we have to accomplish today in our time. So first, uh, we see uh, three main things that we will see uh, in the first point. Uh, when we think of Jesus praying for the apostles, uh, like I said, he is praying because they are about to begin their ministry. And not only that, but he is also making sure that they have everything that they will need to be able to fulfill their ministry, their task that they have been given. And the first thing that Jesus is doing when praying to the Father, he says, I have given them your word. Well, when we think about the fact that he has given them his word, that tells us that that, that is exactly what they need in order for them that they all may be one. Now, this that they all may be one includes, in the first place, the apostles, and then in the second place, it includes the whole church uh, who will be built by the word that they were going to preach. Uh, going back now to Matthew chapter 14, I mean John chapter 14 and verse 15, we see that there is uh, the first purpose of God's word and the life of the apostles. And the first two things that I see is the personal use that they are to give to the word of God that has been given to them by the Christ. And then second, the use that they are to give to that same word when it comes to uh, making other disciples. So the first, uh, the first part in John 14, uh, verse 15, it says, uh, keep them from the evil one. This means that God, through the word that Jesus had given the apostles, and them applying that word in every aspect in their lives, that's basically what God was going to use to protect them from the evil one. I mean, you can see after the Lord is baptized, that he is taken by the Spirit to the desert, and once he is in the desert, he is being tempted by the devil. And in three occasions, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, 7, and 10, we see that all three times that he is tempted by the devil, he responded with the words, it is written. So it was God's word that protected our Lord, and it is also that same word that is to protect the apostles from all the attacks from the devil, from the attacks from the evil one. But then the second use that they are to give to the word, we see in John chapter 17, uh, verses 17 and 19, that they, this same word is to sanctify them. Uh, and, and the Lord is saying, sanctify them uh, with your truth. Your truth is wor uh, the, your word is the truth. Now, what we see here is that process of sanctification. 
Uh, when we think of the apostles as men that were taken uh, from different, different parts and different ways of thinking, we see that now the word has to operate in their minds and in their hearts so that they are able to make spiritual decisions, so that they are able to make decisions based on the word that they had been trained for the past three or over three years uh, during the ministry of the Lord preparing them for, for the apostleship. And then number three, we see that that same word, they were to use it to go and make other disciples. And this is the third part of the prayer. Uh, Matthew, I mean, John chapter 17 and verse 20, it says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. And now we see how this process works. This is a two-step uh, process. Number one, for the apostles to go and make other disciples, the first step in that process is that they first have to go and preach the gospel. We see this in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, and we also see it in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 16. We see that the first thing they are to do is to go into all nations, to go to every creature and to preach to them the gospel, and they are to baptize them in the name of the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit. But then there is a second step to that process and how they are to make disciples. We also see in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20 that after they have made the disciples by preaching the gospel and them obeying that gospel, they are to teach them all the things that Jesus had taught them during that time that he was preparing them. So then when we uh, see that, that process, now this is again everything that is being done through that prayer that Jesus is saying. And now on the second point, I want to focus on how this is all, is this all put into practice once the church begins in the book of Acts. So now I ask you to go with me to uh, the book of Acts, chapter 1, and verse 13. And this is when we see how this prayer begins, begins to take effect. Again, the Lord was praying for the church before it was even established. He was praying for the apostles before they even began their ministry. And now we see the apostles beginning their ministry in the book of Acts. And we're going to see how this prayer was answered by the Lord. And we see how it took effect into the church as it, as it is being established. So Acts chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, uh, basically 13 and 14, we see in verse 13 that the apostles went into an upper room. And in verse 14, it says that they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brethren. And if we move down to chapter 2 and verse 1, it says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Uh, now, Thayer defines this word uh, with one accord uh, being of one mind, uh, the same purpose. And when we think of that same mind, the same purpose that they had, uh, it makes me think of uh, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 where it says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, which means that the reason why they were, they, they were in that up, upper room and they were all together, gathered all in the same mind, is because they had a promise that had been made by the Lord. He told them to wait in Jerusalem until the power of the Holy Spirit would come upon them, and then they would begin uh, their ministry starting from Jerusalem. So here we see that there is faith, there is the word of God, there is something that they were told to do, and now they are all together waiting on that promise to, to happen, and then, of course, they, they will begin their, their ministry. Now, we start seeing that they are, first of all, this is the apostles, being together, being in one accord, being all as one. And now they are about to begin their ministry in Acts chapter 2 with the apostle Peter preaching the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ for the first time ever. And then what we see in, uh, again in Acts chapter 2, as he is preaching the gospel, he is fulfilling what Jesus ha had said in that prayer that they were to make other disciples. Now, the way that the Apostle Peter is doing it, again, this is going back to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, Mark 16, uh, verse 15 and 16, the preaching of the gospel. And when we think of the gospel, the Apostle Paul gives us a definition of what it is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4, we see that the gospel is the death, is the preaching of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we look at that sermon of Peter being preached in Acts chapter 2, that's basically where he's emphasizing. He's telling his audience that the Christ, that Jesus had been crucified, that he had been dead, but that he had been resurrected, and that they were all witnesses. 
and he is pointing the fingers at them, at them saying that they were the reason why he was crucified. So in the preaching of the gospel, we're not only teaching or preaching about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but through the preaching of the gospel, we also have to make the people that we're preaching to know that they need to be forgiven for their sins. They need to uh, basically be aware that as long as they don't obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they're not immersed in the waters of baptism, that they will remain in their sins and nothing will be forgiven. So this is what we see, the reaction of the, the audience in, during the, the sermon that P Peter is preaching. And we see that about 3,000 souls were baptized that day. Uh, we see in Acts chapter uh, Verse 41, I'm sorry, it says, Then those who gladly received his word, uh, that is God's word, were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now, again, this is going back. There was a way, there was a process in how they were to become one, and what they needed was God's word, and that was, that's what was going to keep the apostles together, but that same word was going to be applied in making new disciples. Then we, uh, as we are moving to uh, the book of Acts, we see all this into action where the apostles are all as one, and now we see that they are beginning to make disciples, beginning with about 3,000 uh, on that day of Pentecost. But now I want to look at the life of the disciples in the first century. And we begin to see in chapter 2 of the book of Acts and verse 42, and we're going to read some verses, uh, also 44 through 47, the life that they were living in the first century. It says, and they continued, verse 42, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, that is the doctrine that Jesus taught them, and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And then we go down to verse 44, and it says, now all who believed were all together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among, among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, one of the things that we see here is that it gives us a list, and I see at least 10 things that the preaching of the gospel did with this first disciples and not just the preaching of the gospel, which was the first step in the process, but also as they begin to uh, be taught the whole doctrine or being taught the whole gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, just, like they, just like they were commanded in uh, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20. But there's a list of the 10 things that I see from verse 42 to verse 47. Number one, it says that they were, they can, they were continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, that is not the apostles' doctrine of they themselves, but it was the doctrine that Jesus, when he's praying, he says, Father, I have given them your word, and that doctrine of the apostles that we see here is the doctrine that they had received from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the second thing that we see is that not only were they steadfast in continuing in the doctrine of the apostles, being the doctrine of Christ, but it says that they also remained faithful in fellowship with one another. And that fellowship was only accomplished through that word that they were practicing in their lives. Number three, we see that in doing all of this, they have received the word with all gladness. They are steadfast remaining in that word that keeps them together in fellowship with one another. But at the same time, we see that they keep that fellowship with God because they have that word or they are applying or living that, that word which came directly from God. So again, continuing steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship with one another, fellowship with God. Uh, we see that they are given to prayer. Uh, we see that they are all together as one. Uh, we see that they had all things in common, even to the point that they were selling their possessions to help one another as they had different needs. And then number eight, we see that they continued daily with one accord in the temple. So that means they were continually getting edified through God's word. Uh, number nine, we see that they were having favor with all the people. And all of this led to number 10, which is more and more disciples continue to be made. But we see again that same process. Uh, Jesus gave them God's word, 
Now the apostles are taking that word and they are all being all as one. And as they continue to make disciples, the process just keeps repeating and repeating itself. Because now these disciples, what we're going to see, that these new disciples that have been made, that have been baptized, and that have been indoctrinated, they are going to go out and do the exact same thing that the apostles did with them. Uh, if you see, now we can go and we can move to Acts chapter 8 and beginning in verse 4. And this is after the persecution has already begun in the city of Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, we see that those who were scattered went everywhere, it says, preaching the word. What word were they preaching? That same word that the apostles have given them, which they have received from Christ, which Christ had received from the Father. And then we see uh, also Philip, one of them in Acts chapter 8 and verse 5, that he went down to the city of Samaria, and he was preaching Christ to them. Now, if you notice, these are all the people, the disciples that have been made in Jerusalem. The persecution begins, and now they're being scattered all over the place, and wherever they are going, they are repeating the same process that began at Jerusalem with the apostles. Now, another thing that I want to point out here is that I mentioned that when it comes to making disciples, it is a two-step process. And as a two-step process in the sense that first we have to teach them the gospel. They have to obey the gospel, and that is what's being done here. But then the second step of that process is that they have to learn the whole doctrine. Uh, and now we see that second step also in the city of Samaria, because when we read further down, uh, and I, for instance, in Acts chapter 11 and verse, uh, I'm sorry, verse 25, Acts chapter 8 and verse 25, uh, we see that now they have Peter and John coming to the city of Samaria, and yes, they came uh, because they had the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit to lay their hands on some of the people in that church. But also, when we read in verse 25, it says that when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samarians. So we see that the whole purpose that they came was not only to lay their hands on people in the city of Samaria, but was also with the purpose of testifying and preaching the word, which means farther indoctrinating these new disciples. And then this process again is repeated in the city, in the city of Antioch. We read in Acts chapter 11, uh, verse 19 through 21, that the same process is uh, established. More people that were persecuted from, the, from that same persecution, some of them went to Samaria, some of them went to Antioch. And now we have Barnabas, which is the first one to go to that city, and he begins to see that there's much work to do. He goes and uh, calls Paul, and now Paul and Barnabas together, they are indoctrinating the church in Antioch for a whole year, and that's where we see that they were called Christians for the first time. Now, seeing all of this, again, this is just repeating the exact same process for which our Lord Jesus was praying in John 17, and we see how it continually keeps repeating itself. Uh, going now and, and finishing up this, this second point, there is some, something else that the apostles had to do. Not only did they make disciples, not only did they teach them all the doctrine or everything that they had learned from Jesus Christ himself, but also we see that they, now that they have indoctrinated them, they have to teach them to stay or, or to hold fast to that doctrine which they have learned. And we see a few things that, that happen in the, in the first century, or at least we see in the different letters or epistles that are being written. For instance, we see in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5 that one of the things we need to notice as, as every church is being established, uh, there are different problems that are going on in different congregations. And for instance, we see that Paul, when he talks to Titus, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, it says that he's, he had sent them to Crete. He says that he should set in order things that were lacking. How was he to set order in that congregation? Well, making use of that word which had been given by Christ himself. And then we see uh, again in places like First and Second Corinthians that the Apostle Paul is addressing different issues, different problems that had uh, basically that were happening in those same congregations. What I'm trying to say with, with all of this is that if we think about the churches of Christ in the first century, Yes, there were different congregations being established at different places. There were different evangelists, different preachers going to those different congregations to build them up. 
but as they're building them up, there were certain problems that needed to be addressed, that needed to be fixed. And this is where we have God's word going into those different congregations, uh, fixing each one of those problems that needed to be fixed. But now, how were they able to remain all as one, even with all these problems? Where, well, that unity, or that being all as one, was only accomplished through God's word, in the sense that if there was a problem, someone would be sent to fix that problem using God's word. But also we have the second part, that we have each one of those congregations paying attention to the things that were being said directly by God through the apostles or through someone who brought those letters from the apostles, and those congregations were making the changes that were necessary to keep the unity of the body of Christ all throughout the different congregations. And that's how we see uh, the unity or them being all as one in the first century. Again, I repeat the same process. Christ giving the apostles the word that came directly from the Father, the apostles teaching that word or the gospel to make new disciples, and then indoctrinating those disciples with the whole knowledge of God so that they can go out and keep repeating that same process. But now we go back to uh, our point number three. And our point number three has to do with the unity of the church today, now, uh, to, in this day and age. And remember, the topic that I was given is that they all may be one. And then when we ask the question, how is it that we can all be one? And I know uh, Brother Blake would mention different congregations in different parts of the world. Uh, I've had the blessing of traveling to different uh, places and seeing congregations established in different places of the world. But when we think about us and this topic, how can we all be one? Well, the process, I think I could probably finish here and say, is basically the same thing that was done from the beginning. It all starts with the prayer of Jesus Christ. I have given them your word. Your word is truth, and that word is going gonna, is gonna to fulfill three different purposes. Number one, it will keep them from the evil one. Number two, it will sanctify them, help them to make the changes necessary in their lives to live according to your word, to your will. And number three, that same word is going to prepare them to go and make other disciples, and these disciples will be trained in the same way that they will go out and keep making more disciples. So when we think about the process, this is basically the way that we all may be one, and it all comes down to the same thing, that if we have been given God's word, and we are told that we are to speak and to preach the whole counsel of God, then this is the only way that we can all be together as one. Now, yes, we can find the same problem uh, that there was in the, in the church in the first century. There might be congregations that there are things that need to be set right, that need to be fixed, but this is where we come in with God's word and we talk to these people and we teach them the will of God. And then, of course, they have to be willing to receive that word and to make the changes necessary so that they can keep the unity with us and not only have the fellowship with one another, but more importantly, to have the fellowship that we have with God through his word. So, again, thinking of uh, the, the best way to summarize, this is the process when we think of that prayer that they all may, may be one. This is exactly the way that we all may be one, by staying, by staying faithful to the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are a few things that I do want to point out. Uh, we talked about the three purposes that God's word had, had in the life of the apostles and also in all of us. Number one, I said that it is to keep us from the evil one. And today, more than ever, I think, in our society, we are being attacked with temptations, tribulations, things from all over the world, and more than anything, this is, uh, this is the time when we need to be prepared with God's word in our minds and our hearts so that we know how to face every single situation that we are presented in this life. Whether it is a temptation, whether it is a tribulation, uh, whether it is anything that the devil or the evil one throws at us, we need to be able to defend ourselves, to have the full armor of God so that we are not um, brought down by the attacks of the devil. But number two, uh, we're also supposed to use that word or God will sanctify us through his word and the way that he does that, we think of Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, it says that we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And this is how we are sanctified. The things that we were doing before, as we continue to learn God's word, we start making the necessary changes in our lives as Christians. 
If I, as a member of the Lord's, Lord's church, wants to, want to keep the unity with the body of Christ, that means that I have to let, personally, God's word work in my life and make the necessary changes in my life to be right with God and also to keep enjoying the fellowship with the church. This is all being done through that same process. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, I'm renewing my mind to now think as the scriptures teach me and to live my life the way that God wants me uh, to live my life, doing the things that he wants me to do. And then uh, number three, also as a Christian or the church today in this time, this day and age, we need to keep putting focus in preaching the gospel and making other disciples. I think the congregation here uh, at Spring, I, I do admire the work that every month it focuses on uh, going out and spreading, preaching the, gos the gospel, door knocking, and that's something that needs to be done. Now, that is not the only way that we preach the gospel to people that are lost in the world. Uh, we have also our co-workers, we have our family members, we have our neighbors, we have many different people in the church today to keep that unity. Of course, we want to bring more people to Christ, but that means we have to keep preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to keep bringing more people into the church. But also we have the same responsibility that the apostles had in the first century. And here's what the problem is. Because sometimes we don't give ourselves the time and put the diligence needed to study God's word. That's the reason why there is much error in the religious world today. And it is our job as the Church of Christ to be zealous of that word, to be able to take the time and be diligent for us to learn it, and then, of course, have the love so that we can go and these disciples that have already been made, now we have to equip them with the whole counsel of God. Uh, when I think of the Apostle Paul, uh, I think of Acts chapter 20 and verse 27, uh, when he meets with the elders from the city of Ephesus, and in that verse 27, he reminds them, and he tells them that they were witnesses of how he had preached them or given them the whole counsel of God. And that's one of the things that the church needs to be able to focus today. It's not just going out there and preaching the gospel, but also we need to focus into preparing the members of our congregations to equip them with the doctrine of Christ so that they themselves can be prepared to go and make other disciples. This is, not, this is not a job that is only for preachers or leaders in the congregation or for elders. This is a job that is for every single Christian. You gotta remember that as Christians, you and I are expected to grow spiritually. Uh, we see, for instance, in uh, the book of uh, Hebrews, uh, that you and I, uh, we need to train our senses in the knowledge of good and evil. Now the question is, how do I train my senses in the discerning of good and evil? Well, I have 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17 that it tells us that all the, 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 the God's word was inspired directly from God and it is useful and it gives us all the different things. At the end it says, so that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That word perfect means that you and I have to reach a certain level of maturity in Christ or spirituality. And not only that, but then also through God's word, I am also ready to do every good work. When we think of that, that every good work, and we go back to the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 3, I believe, is where it tells us that uh, being made into Christ, we were made for every good work which God had prepared beforehand, before the beginning of the world. So when we think of all these things, we as Christians, we are to do exactly what God is expecting of us. And there, and there is certain works that God requires from every member of the church. Again, we are to grow in the knowledge of the faith. We are to keep preaching the gospel. We are to keep on ourselves uh, from being stained in the world. Uh, we are to do good to one another. We are to do good also to those outside of the faith whenever we can. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we can do, but all of this, again, uh, as a Christian, I am expected to grow. I am expected to make decisions discerning between good and evil, and I am expected to do exactly the works that God is uh, commanding in his word. And lastly, uh, to finish, we see in uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 5 through 11, uh, that it tells us that as Christians, we are to, pull, we are to put all diligence in adding to our faith. Uh, it says uh, virtue, 
And then not only virtue, but it says that we need knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, uh, brotherly kindness, and love. For if these things are ours and abound, we will never be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what God wants from us. If we think about the Church of Christ today, what we need so that we all may be one, well, we need to get familiar with what the Word of God teaches us specifically for the Church in the New Testament. And we need to indoctrinate ourselves, we need to indoctrinate the church, and we also need to apply uh, that in every aspect of our lives. Uh, this, mor uh, this morning, I guess, to finish my lesson, uh, one of the things that I would like to do is, first of all, for those that are uh, here with us that are not members of the Lord's Church, if you're not a member of the Lord's Church, uh, this morning you can obey the gospel uh, by being baptized for the remission of your sins, uh, by being uh, then added into the body of Christ, which is uh, the church, and to walk in newness of life. But also, uh, something that we need to meditate as members uh, those of us who are already members of the church, uh, something that we need to think about is to take the study of the scriptures more seriously, to be more diligent. We all need to really be taking some time apart or set some time aside in our lives, and daily we need to study the scriptures, daily we need to meditate on them, and of course, going back to what Brother Blake was saying in the end, uh, we cannot forget prayer. We need to be praying for those uh, that are taking part in the pulpits of the church, that they are able to have the means to study and to equip the church with the knowledge of the whole counsel of God. But also we need to pray for every member of the Lord's church, that we have that zeal to listen and to apply God's word in our lives. Uh, thank you for your, for your time. You know, I've been to a lot of lectureships over the years. Heard a lot of speakers. Some of them were considered brotherhood-wide to be very capable in their knowledge and delivery of the message. But I don't think I've ever heard one any better than that. And that's not just flattery, Jose. I mean that sincerely. And we appreciate him and his personal life, his dedication to the Lord. We appreciate his work as a gospel preacher. And we appreciate those brethren that he works with. We have the privilege. In fact, before uh, the Spanish congregation began to meet in this building, both congregations had the custom of eating uh, together, each congregation, on the last Sunday of the month. And uh, we've started doing that together now. Now, I can be a bit selfish and say I sure like a lot of that Spanish food. And uh, I will be. <laughs> but we've had a, a good time intermingling, having the fellowship that ought to be between all faithful Christians. And we appreciate their work. He said Spring was zealous to teach the truth. Well, we want to do what we can. There's always more to do. But I know that uh, they are very zealous in preaching the truth. And we are one in Jesus Christ, brethren of the Lord. I just simply sum up by using the words of Paul as far as his lesson is concerned. The words that thou, the, the things that thou hast seen in me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. So let's keep that in mind with this lesson and all the rest to come and those we've heard. We'll stand dismissed till the top.